Well, good morning, Ritman Grace. Uh, my name is Clark. I'm the pastor here. And if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, love to meet you and your family after service. So feel free to come down and mingle in the lobby a little bit. And uh, love to meet you. Also would love to catch up with you. We haven't uh, been able to connect for a while. Well, this morning we come to Genesis chapter 16 in the story of Abram, Sarai, and Hagar. And as we read Genesis... We want to keep in mind when this was written, but also why this was written. Because it helps us understand the author's intent in giving us the narratives that we have here. So the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, are written substantially by Moses. And they're written on the plains of Moab as God's people have come out of Egypt. And they're about to enter into the promised land. So Moses writes these five books of the Bible to help God's people to understand their history a little bit. To help them understand the story that they've come from. To understand that the law that God has given, the rules and the covenant that he has made with them. And to encourage them to be faithful despite all their confusion and all of their opposition. And one of the consistent temptations as they went on that long journey out of slavery and to the promised land was the temptation to go back to Egypt. For any of us who have read the books of Exodus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy, uh, you're, my guess is you're familiar with that persistent temptation of God's people to go back to Egypt. We see it over and over and over. But let me get you a couple, couple examples of what I'm talking about here this morning. We see in Exodus uh, chapter 16, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, In the desert the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat, ate all the food that we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. And as Dave so creatively led us earlier in this passage, it says all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. The first church split in history, right here in the book of Numbers. When the ways of the Lord seem difficult, when the plan of the Lord seems confusing, it's tempting to want to go back to Egypt. And that phrase, going back to Egypt, becomes a metaphor for not trusting in God. For trusting in our own wisdom And to take matters into our own hands. And that's exactly what Abraham and Sarah do in Genesis chapter 16. If you've been following this story over the past couple weeks. That we've been in this series in the life of Abraham. uh, You're aware that the major tension in the plot so far is the lack of a child. God has promised Abram and Sarah offspring. And it's been 10 years and still no child. So can you imagine what that was like to wait? If you put yourself in their shoes, so to say, week after week, month after month, year after year, that promise still unfulfilled. What is God waiting for, you might think? After a while, you would be tempted to take things into your own hands as well. And that's exactly what Abraham and Sarah do in this chapter. So what does God think about their actions In this chapter, how do we know Abram and Sarah have made the wrong decision? We definitely know it because of the consequences and the fallout that we see take place, but we also know it from the clear allusions in this chapter that we're going to look at this morning to another important moment in the book of Genesis. I want to draw your attention to the screen to a couple similarities that we see here in chapter 16 versus chapter 3. But what we see in chapter 16 today is It says, after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, noticed, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband. When you read that, that's supposed to remind you of another moment 
in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3. Notice, when you compare them next to each other, in Genesis 3, it said, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, also desirable for gaining wisdom, notice, she took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And when we read chapter 16, verse 2, Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. It's supposed to remind you of Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, which says to Adam, he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree which I commanded you, about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. What's going on in Genesis chapter 16 is a recapitulation of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Sarah, like Eve, sees something that she desires, and she takes and gives it to her husband. And Abraham, like Adam, stands by passively and joins in rebellion. So these connections that we're making here are not accidental. Instead, they're an intentional choice by the author if we by some chance thought that Abraham and Sarah would make a better choice than Adam and Eve did, if we thought that the hope for our redemption would come through better human representatives, it's becoming abundantly clear by now that that's a false hope. Because redemption for humanity, healing to our brokenness, forgiveness for our sins, is going to have to come from outside of humanity. But notice a second important feature of the text in chapter 16, verse 1, and also in verse 3. Notice how Hagar is referred to. She's called an Egyptian slave. And again, this is not accidental. This is not a biography that we're getting here. Moses wants God's people to understand that they are not the first to look to Egypt for hope. When their forefathers, Abraham and Sarah, were seeking a solution to their problems, they too looked to Egypt. But it only brought greater strife and greater confusion and more chaos. And even for Hagar, safety and blessing will not come from fleeing back to Egypt, but from returning to the promised land to hold the household of Abraham and Sarah. So if we were to take today's chapter in Genesis, chapter 16, and, and kind of summarize it, boil it down to its irreducible minimum, we might say it like this, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Egypt isn't where your hope is. Egypt isn't where your hope is. Before we dive into the text this morning, I want you to think about this question. What is Egypt for you? What is Egypt for you? Where do you turn when God's ways don't seem to make sense? When his promises are slow in coming? When his plan doesn't seem to be working the way that you expect it? Where is Egypt for you? And perhaps you struggle with disordered sexual desires. God calls you to walk in faithfulness to biblical sexual ethic, and you've been doing that, but it just doesn't seem like it's working. The promise is that it's, this is where life is found seems empty. Meanwhile, maybe there's friends around you that sure seem to be happy as they chase after their desires. It's tempting to want to go back to Egypt. And perhaps you're single and you wish that you weren't. Or perhaps you're married and you wish that you weren't. You're trying to walk in God's vision for relationships, but it doesn't seem to be working. The temptation to lower your standards or the temptation to bail out on your commitment and start over is strong. Why? Because it's tempting to go back to Egypt. Or perhaps you're trying to live a life of simplicity and generosity. Trying to pay off debt and live within your means and give faithfully. But it doesn't seem to be working. Progress is slow and you're having to say no to a lot of things that maybe your friends aren't friends aren't saying no to, and they're enjoying those things. It sure seems like things were a lot better in Egypt. Well, here's what the Lord is saying to you this morning. You ready? Whatever Egypt is for you, Egypt isn't where your hope is. Yes, the wait seems long. Yes, the journey seems slow. 
but don't go back to Egypt. That's not where hope is found. And Genesis chapter 16 makes it abundantly clear. They point us to these two separate scenes. In scene number one, it takes place in the household of Abraham and Sarah. In scene number two, we're going to see it takes place at a well in the wilderness. And in both of these scenes, both of these cases, God is saying to us, Egypt is not where your hope is. So let's take each scene in turn. Let's begin in the first scene. If you have a Bible, hopefully you're there now, but we're going to be at Genesis chapter 16 this morning. So if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the words up on the screen for you. But Genesis chapter 16 is where we're going to be. We're going to break in at verse 1. It says this, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So stop reading right there and just realize you already know what's about to happen, don't you? Because of the tension in the story, because you know what the major plot point in Abraham's life is, you know from verse 1 what's already going to happen. So notice what happens next in verse 2. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So notice what Sarai is doing here. She's spiritualizing her plan. Do you notice that? What she says here is technically true. God is sovereign over the events of their lives and their lives. So technically that's true. The Lord has prevented her from having children to this point. But her implication in saying this is that God needs some help. God has promised something, but obviously that's not coming true. So God must want us to take things into our own hands. To hatch this plan that seems to make sense in our own minds. After all, he's the one who left us here. Do you ever have the tendency to take things and to spiritualize them? To to slap a Bible verse on them? Or God language onto your ideas or to your plans? Because if you do, it's as old as Genesis. But notice what the text says next. It says that Abram agreed to what Sarai said. And nine times out of ten, that's actually a great idea, by the way. But there's times when it's not, right? There are times when listening to the voice of someone else is a bad idea. And in this moment, right here, you're supposed to hear ominous music behind that phrase. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Dun, dun, dun. In this moment, this is morally, ethically, spiritually destructive. What Abram should do in this moment is to be a spiritual leader, to come alongside his wife and to listen. Instead of going along with the plan, maybe wisely encourage a different option and say, hey, I know what you're thinking here. I hear what you're saying, but this is not the way that we should go. But instead, he goes along with their plan. So notice how the story continues in verse 3. So after... Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years. Sarai's wife took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. So 10 years, 10 years, that's a long time to wait. Can we just be honest about that? 10 years is a long time. That that does not excuse their bad decision, but it does help us understand it a little bit because we have to keep in mind here, we have to remember that these are human beings just like you and me. They waited 10 years for God to fulfill his promise. And isn't it true that the longer you wait on God, the more that your doubts begin to grow? The longer it seems like you're just waiting and nothing is happening, the more tempting it is to take matters into your own hands. And so Abram sinfully yields to Sarai's insistence. And we come to see the result of that decision here pretty soon in verse 4 says that he slept with Hagar, and she conceived. And when she knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. So it's tempting to see Hagar as the innocent victim in this story. But this verse does not let us see her in this way, and here's why. Because of the phrase, she began to despise. In verse 4 here. That's the exact same phrase in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, when God promises Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. 
what Hagar is doing here is cursing, dishonoring Abraham and Sarah. And in doing so, she puts herself on the outside of God's blessing. Her response here is not honorable. I think Christian author uh, Paul David Tripp, he has a really great phrase that's helpful for us to know when it comes to make sen making sense of life. And the phrase goes like this. He says that sinners respond sinfully to being sinned against. Sinners respond sinfully to being sinned against. Isn't that just true? That's exactly what's happening here in the story. Hagar has been sinned against. She's a pawn in the scheme. And yet she responds with her own sin to the sin that's been done against her. And that's just the nature of what we do. And meanwhile, Sarah has achieved the very thing that she wants. That was her plan. Her plan was, maybe God will give me children through Hagar. And now Hagar has conceived. Isn't that what she wanted the whole time? She, she thought that's what she wanted until this moment. And then suddenly she realizes that's not what she wants at all. Can you relate to that? You spiritualize, you rationalize, you come up with a plan, you scheme. You come up with a plan so you can chase something that you think that you want, and then when you get that thing that you thought that you wanted, you realize that that's not what you wanted at all. Well, in scene number one, we see Abraham and Sarah taking things into their own hands. They've been waiting for 10 years. God's not coming through, so they come up with their own scheme to help God out, to help God fulfill his promises. And here's what the text is trying to show us. Ready? Ready? That in their desperation, they're looking to Egypt for hope. They're looking to Egypt for help. And we see what happens. The thing that they get, they don't really want. They end up at odds with one another. And then someone is hurt and disillusioned by their own sin. Why? Because Egypt isn't where your hope is. So before we step to scene two, let me just apply this in one particular way that I think that we need to, to reckon with. Because it's important that we hear this message and not only for our own individual souls and our own lives, for our own personal Egypts that we tend to run to, but also that we think about what Egypt is for us corporately. Where do we together fall into these patterns? Well, in America, Christians have grown tired of waiting on God. Prayerful, faithful presence, living quiet lives of Christian integrity weren't getting us the results that we wanted. The culture was becoming more and more secular. The sexual revolution was destroying people's lives. Christianity and religious freedom were becoming more and more marginalized. So as a result of all that, what did we do? We went down to Egypt. We look to political power, both to the right and to the left, to bring about the results that we wanted. But is everything what we hoped it would be? I think it might be time for us to admit that Egypt isn't where our hope is. So at the end of scene one, after Sarah treats her harshly, Hagar flees. And that brings us to scene number two, which we find in the beginning of verse seven. It says, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. Where is this place? Well, we can be sure about one thing. See what I did there? It's on the road between Canaan and Egypt, south of Palestine. Hagar is fleeing back to Egypt. She's going back to where she's from, back to the place that she has known. And listen, Hagar is an outsider in the story, right? After all, we are in a summer series on the life of who? Abraham. He's the main character. We don't even know Hagar's name. We don't know her existence until we come to this chapter in the story. And as an Egyptian, she presumably doesn't share the same faith as Abraham and Sarah. So it's very possible that you could be here this morning reading the story and maybe Hagar is somebody that you resonate with. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're watching online and you're not a Christian. You're not a follower of Jesus. You're not a disciple. Perhaps you're not convinced that Christianity has anything meaningful to say. Maybe you have hung around God's people for a while, like Hagar. And perhaps you're burned by that experience. 
Maybe you have wounds and pain from being, spending time around the people of God. And maybe you have legitimate reason to flee back to Egypt, to leave this whole God thing behind you and to go back to where you were. Well, let me just tell you, if that's your story, God is saying to you today, Egypt isn't where your hope is. Even if you're an Egyptian, there's nothing for you back there. Don't go back there. Notice that God is the one who pursues Hagar. Notice that in verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. That's what God is doing in your life this morning. Pursuing you, seeking you, coming after you. And you may not want to be found, but that's bad news for you because God is in the business of finding people. And he says to Hagar, verse 8, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And you notice her answer. I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Really, when it comes down to it, Hagar's not even sure where she's going. She can't answer the second half of that question. She just knows, I'm going to get out of here, and I'm going to go back to what? Something familiar. Verse 9, the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Well, this just defends our sensibilities, doesn't it? Why would God send Hagar back to this dysfunctional situation? How could a good God tell someone to go back to that? Because, catch this, don't miss this, there's a lot more going on here in redemptive history. Hope is not in the people of God, but it's in the promises that they carry. Let me say that again if you're taking notes. Hope is not in the people of God, but it's in the promises that they carry. Here's what that means. Hagar's hope is not in Abraham and Sarah as a people, but it is in the promises that God has made to them. God has already said back in Genesis chapter 12, remember, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. Abraham and Sarah are flawed people. They're sinners. But Hagar's hope and your hope and my hope is in the promises that God made to them. And in the same way, your hope is is not in the people of the church. It's in the promises that God has made to the church. Every single one of us is a relational being. And every single one of us has a tendency, a proclivity to put our hopes in people. I'm just telling you, just being honest, if you hang around Rittman Grace Brother and Church long enough, here's what I can promise you. We will let you down. We will fail you. Why? Because we're people. And I'm not okay with that. I don't try to do that. We don't celebrate that by any stretch of the imagination. But the reality is this. That's just true. Why? Because human beings are flawed. If you had a bad experience with the church, and by the way, who hasn't, right? But if you had a bad experience with the church, it's tempting to do what Hagar did. To leave behind and to head back to Egypt. And God wants you to know that Egypt isn't where your hope is. Your hope is with the people of God because the promises that are attached to them. It will change your relationship with the church. If you stop hoping in the people of the church, and if you start hoping in the promises of God that are attached to those people, the promises of God that those people hold on to as well, it makes all the difference. There are no promises back in Egypt. The promises are with the people of God. So rebelling and abandoning is not the solution. So in both of these scenes in Genesis chapter 16, God is saying to us, Egypt is not where your hope is. Don't go back to that. The consistent temptation all throughout the entire Old Testament is for God's people to go back to Egypt, to long for Egypt, to turn to Egypt, to trust in Egypt, and to think that Egypt... God is saying to his people, Egypt isn't where your hope is. So how does God respond when we go down to Egypt? Well, the story is giving us a warning, right? It's telling us, don't go down there. Don't go back there. That is not where your hope is. But that's also showing us in this story, we see how God responds when we do. Look at verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. 
This is, this is a big moment in the Bible here. This is the single solitary place in all of the Bible where a human being gives a name to God. Never happens again. The only place in Scripture where a human being names God. Where God allows himself to be named by a person. And did you notice? It's by an Egyptian outsider. Marginalized. Oppressed. Who's on her way back to Egypt. God allows himself to be named by that person. It's not Abram who gives the name to God. It's not Sarah. It's not Moses. It's not David, Ruth, Esther, or any of those great saints that we read about in the scriptures. It's Hagar, the one who had supposed that perhaps God had forgotten her and that maybe she was a pawn in the game of two flawed people trying to work out their promises in their own strength. God's promises. And what she calls God is, you're the God who sees me. You see what the text is trying to say to us today? When we go back to Egypt, God sees. God comes near. God comes after us in mercy and grace and rescues us. What God does here toward Hagar is the very thing he's going to do in a greater measure in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 3, we read, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land. And by the way, that exodus is a smaller exodus in the Bible. It's merely foreshadowing the great exodus that because hundreds of years after this moment, after trial and error and failure, after kings and judges and forefathers and priests and prophets have all failed, just like Abraham and Sarah, the Lord Jesus comes. The Lord Jesus Christ comes, and he goes down to Egypt to set his people free. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, narrates the journey of Jesus this way. So he got up, took the child, his mother, during the night, and left for, what's the word? Say it with me. Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. Why? And so was fulfilled what the Lord said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Which when the prophet wrote that, was looking back to the Exodus, and here's what he was saying, God called his son Israel, his son, the descendants of Abraham, out of Egypt. But Matthew says in his gospel, Matthew says, it was also looking forward because God was also saying, out of Egypt, I'm going to call my one and only son. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has come to fulfill the vocation and the calling of Israel. Jesus, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, broke the bonds of sin that held Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and you and me. Jesus became an outsider like Hagar. Jesus became, he suffered oppression like Hagar in order to break the oppression of sin in the human heart. Can't you see? In order to solve the great problem that Abraham and Sarah got into this mess in the first place. So even when we go down to Egypt, even when we, like Abraham and Sarah, take things into our own hands, we can run back to the Lord and experience grace and mercy and forgiveness because our God is a God who sees, a God who invites us to return to him, who chases after the wayward, who sees the outsider, who comes near in the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine if we were this kind of people at Ritman Grace, Brethren Church. Imagine if we were a people who turned back quickly to the Lord. Imagine if we were a people that when God finds us on our way back to Egypt, imagine if we were a people who would turn to him in consistent heartfelt repentance. A people who would come back to him for fresh grace and fresh power, fresh joy. A big part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus is to keep turning back to the Lord. To keep seeing in ourselves, oops, I'm going back to Egypt. But I can come back. I don't have to keep going that way. And let me just say this. If you're here today and you're on your way to Egypt this morning and you need to turn back to the Lord, listen, some of you really need to hear this. His arms are open. His arms are open. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's no condemnation waiting for you. Jesus has paid it all. Come back to him in humble repentance. 
Imagine if we were not only a people who would be quick to turn back to the Lord, but I want us to also imagine what would it be like to be a people learning to wait on the Lord? A people who are learning by grace not to go back to Egypt in the first place, even when it seems like the Lord is slow about fulfilling His promises. That we would be a people that were learning to wait. We need to help one another do this. That's why we have community. That's one of the beautiful things about making disciples. When you're thinking about going back to that substance, Egypt is not where your hope is. When you're thinking about going back into that bad relationship, guess what? Egypt is not where your hope is. When you're thinking about how the way of Jesus is just too difficult, it's just too costly, it's just too worth it, guess what? Egypt is not where your hope is. That's the good news that we need to proclaim to each other, and that's the good news that Genesis chapter 16 is proclaiming to us. So wherever you are, like Abraham and Sarah, whether you're taking things into your own hands, whether you, like Hagar, have run from the Lord and His people, Egypt is not where your hope is. And God is inviting you back to Him. Let's pray together. Father, we... Thank you for this powerful story that we find in Genesis chapter 16. We acknowledge, just like Abram and Sarah and Hagar, that we too are sinners, that we have turned to our own ways. And in the midst of all this, you meet us, you find us, and you have sent Jesus to deliver us from slavery, from sin, and delivered us into freedom. Lord, I ask that you would make us a people who trust you. Wherever we find ourselves this morning, uh, just pray that you invite us back through the mercy and grace of the cross and the resurrection. Fill us with joy of knowing you as a God who sees. We turn this morning in humility and repentance and faith. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.